I should probably go back and watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. The Secret of the Ooze? The Secret. I I uh I was like a huge TMNT fan as most most boys were my age, our age. Oh yeah. I loved the first one. The second one, maybe I, was I getting too old? Cuz I don't maybe. remember like loving it. You're also very snobby with your media consumption, so maybe that's <laughs> like when it started. World. Yeah, maybe it was like too mainstream at that point. I mean, it has vanilla ice, so in theory I should love it. Quick question. Was Casey Jones your favorite? <clears throat> he was okay. He was he wasn't my favorite. I thought he was cool. Well, for I, sure. I thought he was the best. Yeah. Um, I always had a thing for that wacky, like crazy guy. Um, yeah, A-team, he had a he, big, big Murdoch fan. Yeah, he was the wild card. Yeah, wild card bitches. Wild card bitches. Yeah! I think I I do remember not liking the way that Ninja Turtles looked in the second movie as compared to the first movie. Oh, I see. Was that the reason? I don't know. Maybe it just wasn't as compelling of a story. Also, that was like super shredder. Quick question. Where are turtle dicks? Come one, come all, do a beautiful show. It's gonna be awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of It's Always Stockholm in Los Angeles. My name is Nate Harold. I'm here with Will Noon. Do you guys like the way... Nate always says, yet another episode. Like it's a chore or a burden for him. You're, yeah, that's basically exactly what I'm saying. Can uh, you believe it? Another Can you episode. Can believe it? Uh, today we are talking about season six, episode 11 of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The gang gets stranded in the woods. Written Ooh. by Scott Martyr, Rob Russell, and oh, I'm going to fuck it up. Love Louv- Rocky. Love Rocky. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Uh, directed by Yeah, so Love Rocky. Um, we're butchering that name. Sorry. I, I tried to jump in and, and see what he, he's done. Um, you know, he wrote a bunch of stuff. Nothing really interesting. I think he's r- written three episodes of Sonny and he uh, he was credited as Story By. Which, yeah, I saw, I saw that. Yeah, I, I don't really know, but I guess it's like the the idea for the show versus the actual like teleplay. You know. Oh, interesting. That's what it said in the credits for um, Scott Martyr and Robert Sell was teleplay. Oh, okay. Which I'm guessing is the screenplay, but for television. For television, which is an interesting uh, distinction to make. Right. Right. Um, let's talk about this opening scene. This is, this is a very, uh, Christopher Nolan style opening scene. And you may ask, you may I am say, asking. you may say, what do you mean? How does this opening scene relate to say a movie like Tenant? Which, which I was forced to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of was too. Well, well, it's because the whole scene is exposition. Okay, now for our heathen audience that are not familiar with the term exposition, why don't you tell us what that means? Perhaps repeated listeners will remember this exact same conversation happening (laughs) not that long ago. Uh, Exposition, uh, basically what they're doing is they're explaining what's going on. They're not necessarily like speaking to each other like you or I would speak to each other. They're they're catching the audience up on exactly what's going on, why they're in this car, where they're going, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Which is fine. It's, it's uh, you know, the opening scene is always, like, setting the tone and, like, some episodes are better than others at, uh, you know, lining everything up, explaining everything. This is just pure exposition. Christopher Nolan style. Well, I, uh, I don't really know what that means still after being... Expl- I mean, I do understand. I just don't see the distinction, really. My brain doesn't really register, like, oh, they're talking about their situation rather than just acting in their situation. It's not necessarily different than other opening scenes. I guess it's different in, in that they have to explain a little bit more because they're in a car. They're and- in a car in suits or tuxedos. 
right. not in Philadelphia. And that's, yeah, exactly. The, the text at the beginning does not say Philadelphia PA. Right. Which is, so I think, uh, as, I believe the first time we're seeing that. I believe as, uh, what's that guy's name from I Love Lucy? Desi Ricky Arnett. Ricardo. Ricky Ricardo would say, you got some splaining to do. Does he say that? Is that him? Anyways, yeah. they have some splaining to do. Overall, in this episode, how do you feel as an animal rights activist? <laughs> I knew that was coming. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, first off, the PSPCA is a real organization. Yeah, and Chase Utley and his wife donate lots of money to it. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's cool. a real association, I guess. Not like association meaning group, but connection. It's like that's a real connection between them. I also, I have a monthly donation to the ASPCA that I've done for, I don't know how many years. It's not, mm -hmm. not it's not Chase Utley numbers. I can guarantee you that. But I um, mean, after a long time, although actually now that I say it out loud, I think when I was reading it, it said he has raised that much money. I don't think it necessarily said that he donated that much he's, money. He's still, he's still giving his time and his energy. Totally. I respect it. Uh, yeah, it's funny uh, from an animal rights perspective in a lot of ways. First being that Mac saying that... Dennis, we're going to an animal rights event. There's going to be all sorts of exotic creatures there. You think so? <laughs> Which is like uh, pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Pretty uh, like a, a, a typical uh, Sunny character's naivete really coming to the surface. Right. Or, or the introduction to animal rights or like, I love animals. Right. I don't want to hurt animals. I just want to play with animals all day. Like, let's go to the puppy store. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like, uh, especially with, I mean, no disrespect to ASPCA, P PSPCA, all that stuff. But like that, that tends to, they, they or maybe it's how they market it. It's a lot of like pet right. causes. It's like dog shelters or cats. You right. know, it, it's, it's stuff like that. It's not like dogs, cats, birds, things that you can easily get someone on board with because they have one. It's not like firebomb the Tyson factory, or, you know, like, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's very soft around the edges, which I, you do have to, like, there has to be organizations like that. So no disrespect. Um, and then, yeah, as we, as we go on, I feel like we've, so we've got Max character who, uh, I mean, or I guess I should just say we've got Mac <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, he seems like a newly inducted member into the animal rights world actually guys zoos are animal prisons see i've been boning up on my animal rights literature so i can have some talking points with chase uh he's very excited it's uh, very supportive but uh maybe naive and uninformed i guess right i was gonna say it's like a continuation of the mac that we saw in the world series defense where he's like literally writing chase utley this note as as if he was a child and it's kind of the same thing where he's like, you know, Chase is a big animal rights fan right, or supporter. Exactly. So I'm going to be one of those two now that I right. know this. You see it ebb and flow throughout the episode uh, from Frank's turn from he goes hunting and then the bunny captures his soul. We can't eat the rabbit. He's got my soul. What are you talking about? Frank has a real roller coaster ride yeah, as far as D, his view on animals go. Yeah. D on the same thing. She uh, she wants to kill the rabbit, suffocate its little breath, uh, and then she ends up naming it. I named him Peter Peter Nickel Eater, because last night in the car, he tried to eat a nickel. <laughs> it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. I saw on the internet that uh, Frank is taking a shortcut, right? He's he's not right, he, right, he doesn't yeah. want to pay some toll jockey, I believe is the yeah, term yeah. that he uses, which is something I had never heard before, and it's very fitting. What do you want me to do? Give my, all my money to some toll jockey? Yeah! Just for riding on the street? So I looked it up uh, on the internet. The claim was that this saved $3.75, which may have gone up since then. But I think it has. Because it's funny, before I saw that, I Googled it to yeah. see. And it's a little hard to tell because there's like different options. And I don't know where you start or stop and what this, that. But uh, but yeah, like I think it was like under $5 was the biggest toll for an automobile. Right, right. It's it's ballpark three seventy five. dollars Right. So... You know, do we we don't ever get the number that he donated. Yeah, I kind of wish we did. I, I feel like maybe we get some sort of an idea with the way that Charlie... I'm going to donate another $5,000 to this... Uh, 
this charity right oh, now. Oh. Based on that, we can probably assume that it's thousands. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like say multiple five thousands. could be ten. Could, could be, be yeah, exactly. That's kind of what be I was more. thinking. Because they also let him make a speech, right? And arrange Chase Utley and Ryan Howard to come hang out. Right. So Frank spends all this money, who knows, tens of thousands of dollars, perhaps. He buys a new plastic suit that looks expensive. Bet your ass it's leather. Huh. I just assumed it was plastic. <laughs> well, <you know. laughs> I don't question the things you do anymore, Frank. And he skimps on the approximately $5 toll. Yeah. That's some Frank Reynolds logic right there. I get it, though, a little bit. I get it. <laughs> I was going to say, if anyone gets it, it's going to be you. I, I do. I do get it. No, it is totally a principal thing. I don't think it's a dollar amount. Just for driving on a road? Okay, so I don't know anything about baseball, but Chase Utley, we've talked about him on the podcast before. Second baseman for the Phillies for a long time. Mm -hmm. Just retired a few years ago. Ryan Howard uh, was a first baseman who only played for the Phillies throughout his professional career. He's a diehard, yeah. He's a bit of a power hitter. He is the fastest player to hit 100 home runs and then also 200 home runs. I read that very same factoid. Yeah. Uh, we must have been on the same website who are taking donations now. Yeah, he seemed like a swinging for the fences kind of guy because like, I think he had a lot of strikeouts. I would imagine if you were a Phillies fan watching this show at the time that it first aired, it would be like, yeah, pretty big deal. Two right. star Phillies players. Yeah, it's funny. I see, I don't know if it's because of Always Sunny, but Chase Utley seems like a famous guy. Mm -hmm. But Ryan Howard doesn't. He, it seems, once I read about him, it seems like he should be because he seems like he broke records and won awards and was like MVP and yeah, all these he, crazy things. He holds a bunch of like club records. But I guess I just, name wise, it's like, you know, he's, he doesn't have the name recognition of, let's say, a Jose Canseco. A Jose Canseco, a uh, Alex Rodriguez, a Derek mm -hmm. Jeter. Oh, Derek Jeter, I know. I don't know Alex Rodriguez. I was just naming New York guys because I figured that would Gary be... Gary Carter. My safest bet. George Brett. Doug Gooden. Dwight Gooden. Gooden? Daryl Strawberry. That's the one I was waiting for. Famous Mets player, Daryl Strawberry. I guess, yeah, you can tell when and where I grew up. <laughs> like, you know baseball player names when you're between 8 and 13 years old. Right. Bo from Jackson. your local franchise. So do you know a bunch of like 80s, 90s Brett Kansas City Saberhagen, players? Brett Saberhagen, that's what I'm naming right now. Oh, I've heard Saberhagen. That's a sweet last name, too. It is very fun to say. Saberhagen. Squirrel! Ah! A bit of an overreaction from Mac, but it fits in exactly with what we were just talking about, how he's like a new animal rights fanatic. Yeah, and he does, and this is pretty true to his character. I think, like, I feel like we've discussed it. Like, when he gets excited about the Bible, he, like, goes nuts. Oh, he's all in. You want to talk about Charlie? Charlie's entrance, Charlie's whole thing here. Charlie jumping out of the trunk. We found out that he's never left Philadelphia back in the road trip episode, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now he's freaking out. Uh, he has a great line about trees. See, this is why I don't leave Philly, all right? You leave Philly and bad shit happens. I mean, trees? Everywhere trees? I think a nice, subtle thing they did was they, they gave it a beat before uh, Mac unlocked the trunk yeah i'm not getting any bars though you getting you get any bars frank i got nothing what gives what gives is that we're in the middle of goddamn nowhere <laughs> right they're all out and they're talking and it it's not like an instant thing like oh god we just had, a, had an accident we got to get charlie out of the trunk he's in the trunk yeah let's check on charlie no right it's more matter of fact it's like a yeah it's it's casual it's anyways charlie's in the trunk with a hood over his head I instantly thought of seeing this in movies like Goodfellas, perhaps Reservoir Dogs. Perhaps The Hangover. Don't remember that one. But interestingly uh, enough, go ahead. You don't remember Chang jumping out of the oh, trunk of a car right, completely right, right. Yeah, naked? Nude with a very non-TMNT-like penis. <laughs> interestingly enough, speaking of Reservoir Dogs, I read that the 
original casting for Byron the Trucker was Michael Madsen, mm-hmm. who yep. in Reservoir Dogs is that has an, that most amazing scene where he's dancing to Stuck in the Middle, with, like the razor blade, and he's torturing. oh, he cuts the guy's ear off. Yeah, they went with Tom Sizemore. We'll get to that later. But I just thought that was interesting because I then I googled and apparently like that's a thing. It's called a trunk shot. They didn't do it in this episode, but when the camera's inside of a trunk. Uh, right, and they o- open it, yeah. Oftentimes, if the, if it's a movie and they're shooting on film, the camera's too big, so they build just, they, they you know, a cut off trunk. a trunk. Yeah, exactly, and then pop right. it open. I thought that was pretty cool. Apparently, Michael Madsen had some financial difficulties and had to leave the country <laughs> real yeah. quick. I tried to jump down that wiki rabbit hole and find out what that might be, but nothing really indicated that he, you know, got into a lot of trouble. Which is actually kind of funny because Tom Sizemore had a lot of like drug issues. There were some other issues, maybe not so much tax related or financially yeah. irresponsible behavior. Um, this is where we get the introduction of Dennis in this like new. Did he like just see Yes Man or something? He's got this like whole new perspective on things. Relax, relax, Charlie. This is going to be a great adventure. This is exciting. This is the unknown. This is all part of it. Yeah, I don't know. So he must have like read a book or seen a movie or something. Right, right, right. In between the last episode and this one. Also, there's foreshadowing because Frank, uh, they say like, well, if you spent all this money, why didn't you just get us a private plane? It's only 80 miles. You know how quick that trip would be? It'd be a total waste of money. Foreshadowing. It's only 80 miles. Planting the seed. Yeah, it would have been a waste for him to spend all that money. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna like waste. Minutes. Yeah, Dennis and Charlie go out by themselves. Decamp because she's pregnant. Yeah, she as, doesn't want to walk. As Frank also has a very funny line in the first scene about D. You're pregnant as shit. Frank's uh, plastic or leather suit is chafing him, and Mac is oiling his glove. Ooh, okay. ooh, ooh, ooh. Except I'm not gonna go. I'm gonna hang back and oil up my glove. You, you would have considered me a pretty methodical person, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, like a serial killer. <laughs> serial killer, I like that. Dennis says, I'll take that as a compliment. He has an awkward laugh, and then, yeah. Adding further fuel to that fire, that conspiracy theory that Dennis maybe is a serial killer. Uh, and Charlie is, like, pretty visibly uncomfortable around Dennis. I noticed, like, especially at first. And I met an extremely young lady the other day. Weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in this scene. Maybe they don't spend a lot of one-on-one time together. Right. I mean, I know you love to talk about uh, alliances. Yeah, it's it's pretty rare. The Dennis, Dennis Charlie. Dennis Charlie. Yeah, that's a weird one. And it gets so good in this episode. Like this, this is a this is a case study in favor of the Dennis Charlie alliance. Dennis says something. Charlie misunderstands it, and then hilarity oh, ensues. Go. Yeah. So back at the car, I don't know what happens, but they eventually get hungry. They get hungry very fast. Well, Dee's pregnant. I, I get it. I got to eat pretty soon. I'm starting to get woozy. <sighs> yeah, I'm starting to get woozy, too. She has to eat all the time. And also, Mac's been starving himself for the buffet. And in addition, he's been starving himself even more so because he wants to get that... that sort of gaunt, angular look with my cheekbones to impress him. You know, give myself a more athletic look. But ah, I'm starving. So you're good at math. Okay. Okay, so previous scene, Frank says it's only 80 miles in reference to the private plane flight. Right. Mac says we didn't bring any snacks because it's only a 45-minute drive. How fast would their average speed have to be? Well, at 60 miles an hour, it would be 80 minutes, so it would have to be almost 120 miles an hour. And as someone who's a seasoned driver of gravel roads, let me tell you, that is not easy to do. No, definitely not. But I think that Mac was saying on the expressway. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I, th- I think he assumed that they Is would it like be the taking fucking the fucking autobahn. I-, I guess I haven't been on the expressway. No, well, I'm actually curious. I don't think it's 80 miles. I'm gonna look that up real quick. 62 miles, one hour and six minutes. So 45 I- minutes on an expressway is not. Yeah, out of out, I've, beyond disbelief. Like it's it's possible and probably not even that hard. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if, you know, instead of going sixty-five, if you're doing like eighty or something, you could probably pull it off. And honestly, sixty-two miles, if someone were guessing eighty, uh, that's not too bad either. Yeah. Should 
Should we talk about Byron, the truck driver? Probably. Uh, where are you headed? Atlantic City. Byron, the truck driver, played by Tom Sizemore. Man, he came out hot in the 90s and, and the, the aughts, didn't he? He's one of those guys where he's so recognizable, but I don't know anything as far as like leading roles that I know him from. Leading roles, no. I, I think he's more of like one of those, you know, character actors. Born on the 4th of July, Natural Born Killers, Heat, Saving Private Ryan, Black Hawk Down, Pearl Harbor, et cetera, et cetera. And always sunny because Michael Bay didn't show up. Had some pretty nasty allegations regarding a lot of different things, but we won't talk about it because I don't want to get sued. Dated Heidi Fleiss, the Hollywood Madam. Hollywood Madam Heidi Fleiss. The prostitution, I don't know, what, she's a ring owner? She's a bird lady, kind of like you. Oh, she loves, yeah. She loves birds. She does love birds. She's got like 25 parrots. Yeah. And as you can hear, I have a chicken. <laughs> so like regardless of what people think of Tom Sizemore, what he's done, what he hasn't done, etc. Uh, he does a great job in this episode. Byron is an amazing character. He calls them lot lizards because they're wearing tuxedos. He kind of threw me with those outfits. Yeah. Don't usually find lot lizards out in the wild. Yeah, you know what? I'm a little behind on my trucker terms. Uh, a lot lizard would be a... Uh... A lizard. As we all know, lot lizards are prostitutes that hang out in truck stop parking lots. And Charlie and Dennis are mistaken for lot lizards. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But not again, lizards, not uh, prostitutes. Uh, save your seduction for someone else. <laughs> and Tom Sizemore, or Byron, is uh, is pretty excited. But... He's showing some restraint at first. He has a past with lot lizards, and it does kind of make you wonder what that past is if he sees two like men in their 30s wearing tuxedos in the middle of nowhere and assumes that they're truck stop whores, which is just, you know, just interesting how his mind would get there. Yeah, like, what, what would be the point of that area? Unless, <laughs> unless, like, that's a common exit. I mean, his parking job also is very strange. <laughs> It looks like he's in the middle of the road. Right. Unless, yeah, unless that's like a common exit in the middle of the Atlantic City Expressway. So, you know, you jump off the expressway and you crash there and like, you know, yeah. maybe that's where a lot of trucks park. Who, who are we to say? And there's so many great lines. I'll just throw some of them in there. I wouldn't let you turn me into Swiss cheese. <laughs> I wouldn't let you make me, a, make me into a mailbox. Just open the slot and put whatever you want inside. Uh, not no that. more. I got a wife now, so I will not suck you, and I will not be sucked on by you. Yeah, it's just some really great dialogue. There's some there's some good bloopers for this scene out there. Oh, on I YouTube. haven't seen those. Yeah, but I it's can, great. I can it's only great. imagine. He was on Celebrity Rehab. Actually, I believe Heidi Fleiss had a uh, restraining order against him, and then they like cleared it up or whatever. It expired and wasn't renewed for that. And then uh, Heidi Fleiss moved to Pahrump. Are you familiar with yeah, her? Yeah, 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 yeah. With her 25 parrots. And then she was uh, either dating or married to the guy that owned, like, the bunny ranch or right, something. Right, right, right. Which makes sense. She's had an interesting life. Yeah. It's grass, Mac. You're eating grass. So Mac is eating grass. For a couple of reasons. One, he's in animal rights now and he doesn't want to do what Frank is doing, which is hunting animals Elmer Fudd style. Where are you, Wabbit? I'm going to get you, Wabbit. The second reason is because he's seen Charlie do it. And as we all know, Charlie's a survivor. I see Charlie eating grass all the time. Oh, okay? really? Okay, well, Charlie is not an example of good health, so... Look, Charlie is a survivor, all right? And that's the way we have to think. And then there's a good vegan argument between Mac and D about you eat chickens and turkeys all the time. Right. Why wouldn't why not you eat a dead this, crow? Why would you eat this dead crow that's been dead for who knows how long? You eat dead chickens and dead turkeys all the time? That's so hypocritical. It's not hypocritical. People eat chickens and turkeys. Nobody eats a crow. It's a trash bird. How do you feel about that argument? The, yeah, like the speciesism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, is there a hierarchy? Is there a hierarchy? Uh, what do you mean? Like... Uh, value of life hierarchy. Are humans oh. more important than dogs? Are dogs more important than crows? Are crows more important than lizards? Are lizards more important than worms? Right. Well, 
I don't want to get into it too much, uh, but I think that I see the validity in Mac's argument that you eat birds as is. So, like, what's the difference? Hmm. Yeah. I I see validity in that. I see validity in D saying, I don't want to eat this maggot-infested bird that's on the ground. Right. That's totally different. If there was a maggot-infested turkey on the ground, you might not want to eat that either. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, I, I think Mac's argument is flawed in that sense. But I also agree to a point that, well, if you eat pigs and cows, then why wouldn't, why wouldn't you eat dogs? Like, you know, right. it's, I don't know. It's an argument that's been had one gajillion times and it's probably happening right now somewhere on Reddit. On several college campuses. Several college campuses, et cetera. I don't know. It's something, whoever wrote that scene has experience with this argument. Mm-hmm. I mean, everyone does probably. But, uh, I mean, from Dee's perspective, the, the bait aspect, I guess, in, in a way, makes sense. Because she's yeah. not, not going to let the carcass go to waste. Um, she's just going to lure something else there with it, which is, I mean, debatable as to what animal would go for that. But I see, again, like the larger point that she's making. Something larger on the food chain. Something higher on the food which chain. Which would probably just be like a bigger bird, right? Like a vulture or something. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works. It could have been funny if they like got a big cat involved or something that she was not prepared to capture. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because I don't know what... Because it's not going to be a bunny. Oh, those vicious bunnies? <laughs> right. The bunny carnivores? Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of a funny, weird premise that, that they're going to capture something and eat it. Like, what, what was their plan? Ooh, what if we hide in the bushes and then we wait for something higher on the food chain to come along and grab it, and then we grab that and eat it? That's a good idea. Not a lot of uh, experience in the wilderness amongst the gang, I don't think. I think I was reading some outtake or whatever, and there was a bit of a scene between Mac and D, apparently, that well, didn't make it, where Mac was like, so you're going to skin it, prep it, whatever, clean it, and gut it, and, and do all the things you need to do. Which is my concern, because I guess they could have made a fire pretty easily, but I don't even... Like, as a carnivore... I don't know if I could just like stick a an animal next to a fire and then eat it. Exactly. I mean, these are like city dwelling people. They're they're not thinking that far ahead, right? Because uh, like when D, I mean, D hits that reality very quickly when she has the the rabbit in her hands. You want to eat it so bad? You kill it. Fine. I will kill it. I'll kill it and I'll eat it myself. I'm gonna kill the shit out of it. Those are two different things. I think one is like killing the animal with your own bare hands is one thing. I'm just looking at it as step one. Yeah, but it's like, whether or not you can kill it is one thing. And then whether or not you have the skill to, to prepare it and, and tools. And yeah, exactly. Do you have a knife? Do you have fire? Do you have the, the knowledge as to like what to do and how to do it? And she has neither, right. as it turns out. This scene kind of made me think of like the original Sweet D. Maybe it's pregnancy that's making her a little sweeter. Maybe I'll suffocate you. Suffocate your rabbit face, and I'll just suck all the life out of it, and then twist your neck and... Look, can we do this thing for crying out loud? She's not quite as, like, acidic as she usually is in this this episode. The bunny kind of softens things. I thought we were slipping to a room. You could check my oil. The guys get dropped off at a motel with Byron. Another amazing exchange happening here about how he's changed and he doesn't want this kind of thing. Byron. Remember, you changed? Byron, you've changed. You don't want this kind of thing anymore. No, I do want this kind of thing. The line that I loved was, well, first off, he takes off his hat when he's propositioning them. and like, Yeah, every time. He does it like twice. He fixes his hair, yep. He makes himself presentable. Such a funny, funny little... It looks like a 1950s guy like going to propose and like ask for the, the woman's father's blessing or something. He's, being, he's trying to be as respectful as he can under the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the line that I loved was, I got cash in my pocket. I got desire in my heart. And I'm a frothing and a foaming. Like, he just, yeah, he sounds like he's from the 50s. Yeah. Until he says, it's like, like, it's a wholesome proposition. Yeah, until he gets to the part about, We slip into a room and you two split me open like a coconut. Oh. 
Yeah, and now that I think about it, there must be so many outtakes. Yeah. Because it's one of those, like, uh, Anchorman. That I think there's right. a lot of outtakes. Right, right. Like, great Odin's raven. Yeah, variations on a line. It's already, yeah, like, like, pretty split funny. Split me open like a coconut. Split yeah. me open like a Christmas turkey. Or We slip in a room and you two split me open like a coconut. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I'm so fucking sorry. Charlie the Survivor does a good distraction. Love it. And they slip out. And I just loved the little detail of when Byron is hitting the steering wheel out of frustration, the horn honks. Lock my damn door. I should lock the door. Right, right, right. That kind of shit is always going to get me. Yeah, uh, agreed. Very realistic, in my opinion, whereas some <laughs> of it isn't. But also, yeah. as we all know from being children, that's not how you honk a horn in an right. 18-wheeler. Everyone knows this. The Everyone audience can't you, see me doing this, but you, you, you know what I'm doing. down on some thing. I don't know. You know what there's, I'm doing. There's some chain or lever that's hanging from the <laughs> ceiling in a truck, and you pull down on it. I don't know why, but that's, that's just the way it works. That's how it goes, folks. Every five-year-old knows it. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the casino scene is my favorite scene in this episode. Would you like to bet again, sir? Yes, no. I would. No. <laughs> Let it ride, please. Okay. I'll allow it. Charlie has completely misunderstood the say yes thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he's no longer afraid of truckers. I'm out of Philly, I'm alive, and I'm not afraid of truckers anymore. Right. <laughs> which is an interesting reaction. Right, which which Dennis explains it might, it might be the opposite of what should have happened. He should be more afraid of truckers. I don't know if it's like adrenaline or just confidence, but he's feeling it. Oh, God. My favorite part is uh, when Charlie... We don't see it because Dennis is looking for his phone, but Charlie goes and puts... Apparently, all of his money on black. Right. And Dennis says, hey, that's all of our money. And his line... No, it's all my money. You lost yours when you said no to the trucker. <laughs> right. Which is implying, which is later, you know, fleshed out a little bit, that Charlie would have said yes to Byron in right, the Right, because room. maybe they go into the motel, and maybe he passes out and dies, and then they walk away with a free 18-wheeler. Yeah, this... Whatever, whatever has got Charlie going here is wonderful. Yeah, he's on a roll. And then he's just like saying yes over and over and over and over, which is really ever to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Which carries over to the next bit. But yeah, the casino scene is so good. I read on the internet that they were going to cut this scene, the casino right. scene. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. That can't be right. Because how would Charlie have 5,000 in money. cash to throw up in the air? Right. For that, plus the ride home, like it, yeah, none of it really makes sense. I would think, if anything, the montage could get cut. Not cut, cut, but, like, you could trim that down. Pared down. And it's interesting, because I, I, I also, you know, I read outtakes or whatever, so it's like, this, in its original form, this must have been a very long episode, because at the time, or maybe not at the time, this was, like, the longest episode that ever aired, I think. Right, yeah, I read uh, that FX was okay with it because how, of how well the season premiere did. Yeah, they had a strong season, so they were like, yeah, you can have an extra minute. Anyways, I love I love the new Charlie. I love Dennis all of a sudden being on his back foot. Right. And just along for the ride. Yeah, it takes him a minute, but I think I think Dennis is like, no, okay, you made one lucky decision, you gotta stop. But then by the third or fourth yeah, win, yeah, 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 he's Dennis like, is like, okay, I'm following your lead, whatever yeah. you say. I'm on board. Ah, baby! Woo! Yes! Yes, yes! <laughs> Please, let it ride. Keep okay, it coming. Okay, yeah, let it ride. The crow funerals, kind of whatever. But there is a nice moment with Frank apologizing for the leather suit and for kicking a dog on a subway. I've never been good to animals, wearing a leather suit and all. And uh, also, I kicked a dog in a subway once. It was a real jerk move. I'm really sorry I did it. And I like animals now. That was a real dick move. Yeah, I it's, it's that one. pretty rare to see Frank in like a... Um, regretful remorseful kind of tone yeah, so he likes animals now yeah so i thought that was kind of nice the the frank reynolds animal animal rights roller coaster is going up and down yeah 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 well i mean the money took his soul so 
That's a, yeah, that's a good point. We need to talk about the bunny, but they, as Max says, like, that's a, that's a fact of nature. That is the connection between man and beast. Animals can see souls. That is a fact of nature. <laughs> I mean, I kind of agree with it to, to a point. Charlie won 15K. Yeah. We don't know what he started with, but he ends with 15K. At the PSPCA benefit, he's eating asparagus with his hands. I mean, this is a this is another amazing scene. This is just Charlie doing the yes thing. Hi, Mr. Reynolds. I'm Deborah. We spoke on the phone. Yes. Yes. Well, now I know you'd like to say a few words. Is it all right if we have you up to speak now? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> Great. Yes. 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 <laughs> and his speech is about the word yes and animals. Right. 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 And there's another great Charlie Kelly line, which is, If animals have taught me anything, it's that you can easily die and very quickly under a bus and on the side of the road. Yes. I mean, yeah, that's where I see dead animals. Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole speech thing is great. He gives another 5K for the rats, presumably from the last episode, because... Yeah, he was, he was pretty uh, bent out of shape about killing all those rats, so there might be some remorse there. And of course, when donating the money, he just throws the handful of cash at the audience. <laughs> yeah, the that's how you do which it. Which is awesome. That's a, oh, you, that's too generous. This is for the rats. Take it easy. All right. Hey! They. Uh, this is where it it sort of goes over that line for Dennis. Yeah. Because they uh, they they announce that they have one more special thing planned, and uh, you know we know your friend is a big Chase Utley fan, so Chase Utley and Ryan Howard come out. Hi. Mac, right? Yes. I hear you're my number one fan. Yes, I am. <laughs> That's when Dennis gets converted to the just say yes approach that he suggested, kind of. Charlie, but he's doing Charlie Charlie's Amp version. Yeah, Charlie has a different version of it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dennis is converted, and he says yes, and they have a, a weird montage. Glory Days is the song. Right. It's a, a montage of Dennis and Charlie drinking a lot, chugging wine and beer. Ryan Howard and Chase Utley drinking water and looking concerned. Dennis does a magic trick. Oh, right. He pulls a quarter out of Chase Utley's ear and then Charlie <laughs> sort of tries it and Ryan Howard shuts him down. We see Charlie playing piano with an old woman who turns out to be his grandmother. His real life grandmother. Who's like 90 years old or some shit. That's a very sweet thing to do. Yeah. Do we know where Charlie grew up Charlie Day? No. I thought he was an East Coast person. Yeah, I think he is. Yeah. Let's look it up. I wonder if they like flew his grandmother out for that or if she was just in town so they did it or or maybe for the authenticity of the Harris Casino, they actually rented the room. He spent most of his childhood in Middletown, Rhode Island. Maybe she was just visiting, you know, visiting the family. I mean, they do have some... Well, no, yeah, uh, no. I was going to say they have some establishing shots, but those could be anywhere. Yeah. I noticed that they were sitting at the chimpanzee table, which is probably no coincidence. I did not notice that. Because they're behaving like a chimpanzee might. I love when they're just drunkenly wrestling and like the guy's vacuuming the floor, like everyone's gone. Right, right. And uh, Charlie does get a little upset. He gets like drunkenly upset at Dennis for Dennis touched him one too many times or something like that, and he says, <laughs> <"Okay>, <laughs> off me though, "For real, <laughs> okay." <laughs> Very accurate drunk acting. Uh, there's a little biting involved. <laughs> I just saw you bite that dude. Yeah, yeah. They have 10k left. Dennis knows how they can spend that shit. We then cut to Frank. They're sleeping in the car. Frank is in pain because he dug up the crow and ate it. Amazing. Which again. Did he just eat the whole bird? Did he just Feathers? bite into it? Yeah. Beak? But Danny DeVito is very good at acting in pain. I thought this oh, was yeah. a good performance from Danny DeVito. <laughs> oh, oh, it's tearing me up inside! What? What? What's, go what's going on, Frank? What are you doing? Yeah, I can't imagine what that stomach ache would feel like. Charlie and Dennis are extremely drunk in a private plane. They text Mac... The picture of Chase and Dennis, which we won't get into the logistics too much, but it is, they are mid-flight. Right, mid-flight. Also, <clears throat> there's a few things there. Yeah. One, is that the next day? Yes. 
Where did they stay? I think they just partied all night. Oh, so you you think that scene at the when they're wrestling is like six in the morning? N- not not necessarily, but I th- I could see them just going back into the casino to a bar. Oh, okay. Just okay. finishing out the night. All right. And my other concern is that when Mac gets the text message, I know what you said. Oh, it's Dennis. Yeah. You getting reception? Yeah, I guess I'm getting reception. I just got a text. Oh, it's from Dennis. But he Dennis texts with Charlie's phone. Yep. So that was a little sh- shady for me. I didn't yeah. like that. I'll allow it. Uh, Mac at this point convinces uh, Deandra to release the bunny because instead of eating it, she's going to bring it back to the bar. She named it Peter Peter Nickel Eater. Uh, but Mac, as a animal rights activist, <laughs> says that the bar is not a suitable place for a bunny. It should be out in the wild with its bunny family. It needs to live in the wild, where it can be free and safe in the loving embrace of Mother Nature, okay? Trust me, Peter Nichols Eater is going to be much happier. <laughs> there you go. Followed quickly by some great foley and a, um, what I'm assuming is a crow. I mean, look, yeah. It, <laughs> it looked like a crow. It doesn't look like a bird of prey. Yeah. And it grabs the it grabs the bunny and makes like an eagle sound as it's flying away. Yeah. So is this CGI? What is this? It looks yeah, not realistic, but realistic to me. It looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I don't understand. Like I looked at it I watched it a few times and I was like, that looks like a real bunny hopping away. Yeah. And that Looks like something came across the screen and then it grabbed it and went away. Like, well, if you watched the full episode through the credits, you would see that no animals were harmed in the making of this episode. Oh, so you're saying that they didn't just release the bunny and it happened naturally? They just had to do it like 400 times until something came by? There's a God damn it, which is notable, I think. God damn it. God damn it. Okay, nature is bullshit. I'm Told done with this. Animals suck. And it's capped off with a great scene of the remaining gang running into Byron. And oh. Byron yep. says, Whoa. Hey, you, Mr. Hottie, come on now. Right, he's right. doing this great, confused look like me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really well done because you can see Dee and Frank in the window from yeah. Byron's perspective. Right. And they're like, hey, yeah, great. Oh, my God, we, we're stranded. Do you think you could give us a ride? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, and he's, like, very cordial. And then, yeah, when he addresses Mac as Mr. Hottie, <laughs> that's when Mac sort of, like, the camera pans or Mac steps into the scene, and, yeah, he points to himself. It's just really well done. Great way to end an episode. Will Noon, do you have a letter grade for The Gang Gets Stranded in the Woods? Well, here's the thing. I don't have too many lines from this. There were there were lines. There were, for sure. Trees sure. everywhere. Or everywhere trees. But I think in general, I just really liked it. It was like, I don't know. There was just something very believable, very like flowy about the conversation mm-hmm. throughout the entire episode. And I just really liked it. It's like a very heartwarming or not heartwarming, but like feels like a comfort episode for me. Sure. In a sense. I could see that. So I'm going to give it an A+. Plus. I am going to give it a B. Um, Whoa. It's good. Uh, I think one of the strengths, and this is going to sound probably kind of weird, but I think one of the strengths is that this is an interesting episode because it's not in the bar and it has nothing to right. do with the bar, which is doesn't sound like much just saying that, but if you watch the show, you realize like, that is a pretty big deal. In this world. It's like 95% of the shots are inside that bar. Right. So I think that just the the premise itself and then all the like sort of philosophical, ethical conversations that happen are good. And of course, I love the casino scene. Uh, I love Charlie misinterpreting something in a very dangerous way. And it works out like gangbusters for him. But I don't know. It's just one of those episodes where uh, I like it, but it's it's nothing notable for me. Byron's a good right. character. You don't deserve to be here. And that's it. Next episode will be the season six finale. For some reason, I thought there were two more, but we're going to see Dee preggers or give birth, right? Dee becomes unpregnant. Oh, interesting. Tune in to find out how that goes. 
bye bye. Brought to you by the Maddie and New Network.